Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. James Smith Jr. and Welcome back to another edition of the Dr. James Show. Again, I know I say it every week. We have a very compelling, inspiring guest. And today is no different. Her name is Dawn Holden Woods. Dawn is the CEO of Generative Consulting Partners. She also likes to say she is a co-conspirator for good. And look at that picture, y'all. She's wearing those pearls. I want to find out about those pearls because I've seen several pictures and she wears her pearls. Dawn Holden Woods, welcome. Welcome, welcome to the Dr. James Show. We are so happy to have you. Why don't you come on out and join us as we begin to chop it up a little bit and talk about you, where you've been, and where you're going. What's going on? Hello, hello. Thrilled to be here. <laughs> Why are you thrilled to be here? <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to be in, in spaces with people that you trust and people who you respect and respect. Mm -hmm. I respect you and your work. So, and, and it feels a bit like a full circle moment given that, you know, we originally met during my inroads days. So, so just really, really grateful to have some time with you. Tell me about those days. What do you remember most? What was the greatest gift you received going through that amazing, amazing program? For me, Inroads provided such an affirming space as a you know young black woman whose parents I feel like instilled a lot of values, but my parents um, were not college educated, and so I felt like I was preparing for a journey that we were all excited about, but it certainly wasn't one where they had firsthand knowledge or experience to help me professionally. Right. Um, and so Inroads just created a safe space to to be honest about, you know, our fears, our concerns, what was working, what wasn't working. It just felt like I had a whole community of people who wanted to see me win. Mm. Um, and, and I love it. I, I love everyone that I've met. So many of the people that I'm still in touch with were people that I met through that three year time frame that I was connected with Inroads, both the leaders of Inroads and all the folks who were like a part of my cohort. So wow. now during your introduction, I mentioned your pearls. Is that your signature look where you wear your pearls or just for a one, one sheets and, and headshots? <laughs> no, so I, I am certainly a pearl where I used to joke that it was part of my, um, it was my uniform, it was my professional uniform, at least prior to the pandemic when I was in the office every day in a more formal setting. You know, it was like a dress and pearls and I always felt polished and, and put together. But I'm also a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. So all lovely women of Alpha Kappa Alpha, we also tend to to love our pearls. So. All right, let, let's let's stay there for a second. I, I, you said AKA. <laughs> um, I, I think we may have a picture of you during your college days. Let's take a look and see if we could. Uh, you can speak to this picture. What's going on? <laughs> What's going on? Um, <laughs> so, I, to be fully transparent, I am um, actually joined Alpha Kappa Alpha and was initiated after my college mm -hmm. days. So I just okay. want to clear that up. Um, mm -hmm. Since I went to college at Lincoln University, but was offered the opportunity to join this great legacy sure. through Rho Theta Omega chapter, um, so just want to make sure that's clear. But no, this was this was a part of our initiation process, mm. and so this was this was the day that our chapter introduces us to um, essentially the world as, as members, and so it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I feel incredibly grateful to be connected to the 30 Passionate Pearls, which was was the love name of, of my line. Yep. Love it. I love it. So I guess Michelle Obama took pearl lessons from you, huh? <laughs> she saw your Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> now, in your role as a leadership consultant, um, what type, type of problems do you fix or that you coach people on? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. I, I like to think of myself as a thought partner, mm. you know, but that, but that thought partner that you can be 100% honest with. Because, you know, in most professional settings, we tend to filter information, right? Like we share with people what we think we can share that, you know, maintains the relationship or the boundary. And so part of what I like to think about in coaching is I'm, I'm here at 
your, you know, at your discretion. And so we need to be fully honest in order to move forward. And really the problems that we're, we're fixing and we're focused on are, are really things that are within ourselves. So, you know, most of the people that I work with are skilled in whatever the thing is, right? So it's not about technical knowledge. It's about leadership challenges, right? Which are always complicated, um, and it's really helping people think about their life experiences, their family experiences, the biases that they hold, right? And how does all of that play into who you are as a leader and how you approach your work? And I think- Correct me if I'm wrong, you work with a lot of senior people, right? You're coaching directors, VPs and up, correct? Correct. Although. I also have coached some people who are in, you know, maybe supervisory roles. So some new leaders. I've also been spending a fair amount of time recently with a number of founders who have created some amazing um, nonprofit organizations. And maybe they've always been activists. And now you're running an organization and running an organization is very different from just focusing on, on the work. But I, I'd like to let everybody know that we all have all of the power that we need within us. And so it's really just about how do you unleash it? How do you remove the barriers and the things that are preventing you from really being great? And, and spending that time with everybody to understand what that is and, and figure out how we can move forward. Tell us how you do that. What's your approach? What's in your special sauce? Because sometimes it takes a minute to get people to open up, to be vulnerable, to be authentic. How do you go about doing that? Well, I think part of it is I try to model it. So I'm very, I'm very honest about sort of who I am and my journey. Um, and, I, and I think that helps people feel comfortable that they can do the same. Um, and it's really about re building relationships. I totally agree that when, you, when we meet people, right, like we meet our representative. So yes. it always takes yes. Yes. time, right, to build the relationships. And then at some point, I feel like someone says something, and you're like, let's put a pin in that. Like now mm -hmm. we've finally gotten to the moment of like what we're really working on. It's not whatever problem you're facing that brought us together, or it's not just, oh, I started this new organization and this is all new. So I want to work with the coach, right? At some point we hit the thing right. that you're like this is it and if we unlock and retool this you know we'll get where we want to go and it's also about i think offering people tools that's the other thing so whatever your challenge is it's like here's a resource here's here's a training that i've gone through here's something that i've worked on here's a book that i love um that is important to me. Like it, it's really about, I think those moments where it's like you have a challenge and then learning that there are also other tools or there are other individuals who might be in the same space. And it's like, oh, I know this woman in Nevada who's going through the same thing. I'm going to connect you, right? So it's like, how do we build those networks so people don't feel so isolated? Because I would say isolation for, Black leaders in particular is something that I think people face because oftentimes they're not in organizations or spaces with people that look like them and they feel like they're facing these challenges and they feel incredibly isolated. And I'm sure they feel your candor, your humility, your selfless personality. That's, you know, maybe before I do a show, I talk to people, I do my research and a lot of love out there, a lot of love out there for, for you. Just wanted you to know that. I appreciate that. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, question. Um, for many people, during the pandemic, they lost their mind. They turned into victims. They, oh, what am I going to do? I want things to go back to the way they used to be. Woe is me. But you said, go is me and started your own company during the pandemic. What? Number one, I want to know your why for that. And I want to know about how courage and or fear played a role on that journey. Ooh. Mm, things to make you go, ooh. Right, I was like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say I was definitely a person during the pandemic that had more time to think. So um, Mike Vogel, who was 
one of my um, favorite bosses I always say that and and proud now to call him a, a friend but when I moved into my first executive director role and he was retiring sometimes he would just call me and he'd be like did you make time to think or he'd send me a text and and it, and it was always the same question um, and sometimes it would be frustrating because I'm like I have 50 other things to do like I don't have time to think um, but then when I would create the space to think it was always like right like creating the space to think is really where we we do our best work right and so the pandemic because i wasn't shuffling to events every other night after work or i didn't i wasn't trying to catch up with with every friend and every you know colleague i just had this time after work to think to think about well what's really important what do i what do i want my life to really be you know, who are the people that really inspire you that you, you really miss during this time? Who are the people that maybe you learn you don't miss as much, right? Like life still feels as full. You know, what are the, the types of professional spaces that I want to spend my time in when the world reopens? And like, what are the places that perhaps I've outgrown, but I didn't have like the, the guts to, to just sort of acknowledge that, right? But, but the pandemic sort of, you know, brought all of those things to a halt. So it was really through a lot of really intentional thinking that I realized that I was ready to move on and do something different. And I, and I will say, I loved, I loved serving as a leader at turning points. Like I feel like you just see the best of humanity when you work with social workers mm -hmm. um, and people give so much of themselves in their lives in service of others. I mean, it was just something that I'd never, ever, really thought about before sort of joining that work but then when you see what people are giving for other people's children and people get up on christmas to take kids to be with their relatives when they have their own kids and families at home it, it was just the level of i think um intimacy and support that people have for others that that i just admire um about people in that work and then you know being promoted into a larger role at a public health management corporation to be a chief of a public health organization even though i wasn't the ceo just to be a part of that executive cabinet during you know the largest public health crisis of our lifetime being with people who are trying to figure out how we might respond um and i at, at that point in time one of the teams that i would had the honor of being a part of was a research and evaluation team and trying to figure out like, how can we gather data? What, what do we know? Um, it, it was something that was meaningful, but it also brought me to a point where I had to acknowledge that I didn't have the same energy and passion and enthusiasm. And that's something that I often talk to leaders about because we focus so often on getting a role that we don't actually ever really think about how will you know when it's time to move on, right? And, you know, I started having those moments where I remember saying to myself, if someone else was sitting in front of me and they said the things that I was saying, right? Which mm -hmm. was like, I felt constantly burnt out. I, it was getting harder and harder in the morning to get up, to do this work. Like these are generally indications of burnout that if, if someone on my team was saying these things, I would have to look at them and I would say, well, we know what this means, right? <laughs> You're now well, going through your job, not growing through your job, yes. That's exactly right. And I used to always say like, when you're a chief, I'm like a big part of your role is like, you're the cheerleader, you're the inspirer, you eliminate barriers, you're help, like that's your job. And so when I don't, when I can't really get into that space to do that work authentically and so part, so much of who I am and how I try to lead was like being authentic. So at the point that, you know, someone's telling me their problems and I want to say like, run, <laughs> we should leave. <laughs> both, Call both 911, us. not me. Yeah. You know, I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know what we're going to do, you know, like, <laughs> When, when I'm feeling helpless and you're feeling helpless, that's an indication for me that it's time to do something else. And so that was a really hard pill to swallow because I'd never really thought about what was after this work. Like for so long, this is the work that I wanted to do. I never really thought about what else did I want to do? What else do I enjoy? Um, but I was determined not to let my um, I was determined not to let the future and not being yeah. clear about what lies ahead 
keep me in a seat that I felt like someone else should occupy, right? I was like, as a leader, people need to be there, wake up every day, 100% ready to perform and inspired. And if I know that that's not me, and it's not like I can just take two weeks off <laughs> and be back in shape, then I have to I have to let it go. So that's what prompted me to choose to move but in another have, direction. Have the courage to do that. I remember for me, I left corporate in 1998 and I was a VP at the time. And I remember telling my mom I was leaving to start my own company. She's like, no, no, you're you're senior leader. You have your own office, it overlooks city hall, you're there. But mom, I'm not feeling fulfilled. I want, I don't, but but this is what you went to school for. This is 14 years. And like you, somehow found the courage, the zeal uh, to move on. And like you, I wasn't feeling fulfilled anymore. I wasn't living my ministry and it took the leap. Did you feel any additional pressure being a black woman about to start her own company during the pandemic? with all the misery, ambiguity, uncertainty that was going on? No, that's not actually what I was most worried about. So I was worried about, as a Black woman, how it would look to leave my team because I probably had one of the most diverse teams within the organization. So I was more like, what does it look like as a Black leader <laughs> to come in and tell everybody, sorry, guys, I know we're in the middle of a pandemic, but like, I'm out you know, and not wanting that to sort of have a ripple effect of sure. sort of inspiring others to do the same. So that, so I thought a lot about that. You know, I, I have to say I was incredibly blessed to have a spouse. You know, my husband was super supportive um, and has been an entrepreneur himself. So, you know, when I came in and was like, you know, I'm ready. And I think, you know, we had to talk about it for a while because I think he was like, are you sure you're ready? Because this is all you've ever wanted to do. Um, and, and so, but he was 100% on board with me starting my own business. And I think his belief was like, oh, and if you, if you don't love it or it doesn't work, like you're skilled, you can, you can rejoin the workforce if that's what needs to happen. So, for, so he actually was probably less scared than I was. So he was really sort of an anchor in that way to say like, we'll be fine. You should try it. You know, how will you know you don't like it if you don't try it? But there was a lot of, of I mean, certainly a lot of fear. I, I've spent my entire career since I've graduated college working. I've never, ever been without a job. And so the whole notion of like, well, you don't get paid if you don't have work. I was like, uh, I don't know about that. I do like my paycheck every two weeks. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that, so, that changes when you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> so, you know, but then on the flip side, as an executive director, you have to fundraise. So the so while it's not exactly the same, the, the notion of like having to sell a, sell something to raise money, I was like, well, I've had to do that for the organization. So now it's it's getting more comfortable around selling myself right, as, as the product. And I will say that has taken, I think that's taken some work because I was raised, right, to be very humble, to not really, you know, to not really brag. And so trying to find that balance of being very clear about what I offer, what I bring to the world and being unapologetic about that is something that I've had to really get comfortable with mm -hmm. and wrestle with in a new way for myself. That's awesome. That's awesome. We have a couple questions from the audience. Before I go there, I, I want to just finish or close the loop on our conversation about the pandemic. I want to show a video that I saw of you talking about your thoughts about the <laughs> pandemic and then have you close the loop and do you still feel the same way? Well, let's just take a look. What do you hope will come out of all of this or maybe it just for you personally? what do you want to happen after all of this one thing that i'm you know really hopeful and one thing i'm looking forward to is really the opportunity to gather i mean i know it sounds silly but i think i took that for granted and so i hope that we'll be able to come together and really appreciate one another i mean i know before i was always thinking about oh i'm busy and i'll, I'll drop in something and i'm gonna head home and and so really wanting to remain connected um that's something that i hope 
will come out of this. I think the need for community, I think when things are good, you know, it's easy to go about your day and not really feel like you need to check on other people and really, you know, cultivate personal communities. And I think it's been great how much I've, I talked to some of my friends that live in other states um, now. And so really wanting to continue to just like think about others and build that into my daily life. And um, also being grateful, you know, good health, wake up every day and, and, you know, there are days where I might write in my journal, like, oh, I feel grateful for good health as I start today, but it really hits differently during the pandemic. I mean, when you know people who've been impacted, when when you hear stories of those you love who have friends um, and colleagues who are impacted, I think just like the importance of focusing on our health and making good choices every day and make sure and ensuring that there are equitable resources in all communities to really focus on, on you know, personal health when this pandemic is over. Because the truth is the folks being hit the hardest and communities of color now, like didn't have the resources they need before, they needed before the pandemic hit. And, and so I hope that we can really elevate that conversation coming out of all of this is like, what are we going to do differently as a community to make sure that, you know, there's health care for all, that there are healthy foods in all communities, that they're easy to access, that they're affordable. You know, those things really matter. Drop the mic, drop the <laughs> mic, drop the, bam, bam. I know Derek Green's running for mayor. You may, <laughs> I'm joking, joking. Tell me, has anything changed? Uh, by watching that, what came to mind? So I would say the short answer is no. And I'm really glad you you pulled the footage because obviously we didn't talk about this. So I didn't know that, that <laughs> you had that, that clip. I think that has been, those three things have been the things that I have been most focused on and feel like I have more space yeah. to really be intentional around now that I have my own business. So certainly community, um, definitely gathering with friends, gathering with family. I feel like, you know, we've opened our home more than we have in the past. So, so I would definitely say cultivating community, both professionally and personally, has remained at the top of my list. And, um, you know, making sure that, I, that I'm trying to, to also model what I receive and what I want to receive, right? Because, you know, I, sometimes when we get busy, you're like, oh, I forgot. And so just trying to be really intentional about it. So that is certainly still true. Gratitude for sure. So every morning I try to make sure that I list at least three things that I'm grateful for and, and really specific, like, you know, the phone call that came at the right time from a friend that was inspiring or affirming, or it was the push you need, right? So, so definitely focusing on gratitude um, and, and, and just being mindful of, of all the things that I have and being mindful that it's a gift to be in a space to explore. You know, everybody doesn't even have the space to say, I'm going to leave a job. You may or may not have a spouse who's supportive of that. So like all of that was a gift. And so just, just being intentional about, about remembering that. And then I think um, around pushing for more equitable communities. I mean, certainly I'm not able to do that in the same way that I was doing that at PHMC and Turning Points. But, you know, part of my consulting work has me working with um, home-based child care providers. Um, it also has me connected to some foundations, have me supporting Black leaders who are running organizations around the country. And so I, I get to sometimes bring them together as a community. Um, I've just completed a report where I interviewed a number of these leaders and some national funders to try to figure out how we can have more black founded and led nonprofit organizations be play a larger role in sort of the ecosystem. Yes. So I, I think I have sort of been focused on these things, even though I forgot all about that interview <laughs> with Michelle. Um, but yeah, that, that right now that has been that has been my work. And I, and I feel incredibly grateful and honored to have the opportunity to, to spend time thinking about it and just to be in community with these leaders that I just, you know, admire. 
I love it. I love it. And we're just getting started. We're going to go to the <laughs> audience. The first question, what do you think are three keys to help individuals and organizations unlock their full potential? So what do you think are three keys to help individual contributors and organizations? And I would even say people leaders as well. Three, key, three keys for them to unlock their full potential. Mm, so three keys, I would say one, the first key being for leaders in particular to focus on soft skills. And I know we've mm. talked a lot about that, mm. but most people get promoted, right? For, for concrete technical skills, right? right? You're a problem solver, you're a go-to for something, you deliver results. That's how you end up moving into these roles. Then you get in the role, and now you have to inspire people and build teams in a different way. And it's like, it's a totally different. Yeah. Yes. And, and Dylan, let, let me interject real, because you touched on what I call one of my pet peeves, because doing that work is so hard. Why do we call it soft skills? Mm. I call them people skills. Yes. People skills. And as you're saying, leaders are alert. Some leaders are allergic to it. You can continue. No, I, so, so I like that. People skills is certainly a better word. So I focus on people skills because, you know, that is what you spend most of your time on as a leader is either inspiring people, looking at problems. They all involve people, generally large numbers of people, right? Whether it's they're not in communication, they're silos. So I would say people skills being at the top of the list and like leaning into that, because I think most people with concrete skills struggle to see how people skills actually deliver results. But before you move to number two, I, in doing my research, you, 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 you said that being kind is simple, but often forgotten. Uh, you talked about acceptance, being more accepting. Um, just, just as you said, these people skills that are common thoughts but not common practices i love mm. that you put that as number one so people skills are that's that's always in um and and i and i'm a firm believer that whatever role you're in people skills will always win they always win <laughs> yes yes um i would say the second thing is to cultivate curiosity mm. right so most organizations and leaders have we have these like these narratives that play over and over again in our head. We generally decided why things are the way they are, why people are the way they are, the why why our bosses are the way they are, right? And and I think we forget about curiosity. And one book that has really changed my life is called Change Your Questions, Change Your mm -hmm. Life. Nice. And I love that book. They talk about cultivating um, a learner mindset. And so that's something that I often encourage folks that I'm working with to read. Like, it's like, are you judging or are you learning? But I would say being curious, right? Like, why is it that you, you believe this? Why is it that you solve problems this way? Why is it that you handled this this way, right? Like, I think just leaning into curiosity versus judgment, um, that's something that I think is important for folks who are new in roles and people who've been there for a while. Like sometimes I don't think we've ever questioned why we, why we do things, right? So, so that is definitely number two for me. Um, Walt and I'm Disney, sure- Walt Disney who once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. So imagination, mm -hmm. being curious, thinking, creating, I love it. And the, Third one, and again, I'm laughing because I was like, had I got this question in advance, I probably would have come up with, <laughs> who knows, something else. But, but just thinking about this, the third thing is fun. My old boss used to say, learning is directly proportional to the amount of fun you have. Mm. Why, 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 why fun for you? Because I think as adults, we forget how important fun is right like we're so focused on all the things we need to do whether it's people whether you're caring for your child or a parent or your job like we're, we're focused on our to-do list and we're not sometimes we just don't lean into fun and laughter and joy and recently I had the opportunity um, 
with one of my clients to help curate an event for leaders and their grantee network. And the facilitator who we landed on to lead this particular body of work, her a lot of her, her material is like leaning into your body, it's being active, um, and then it's having fun. And she had everybody up and moving around and laughing and engaged in some activities where I feel like there, some of us in the room were looking at her like, you want us to do what and how? Um, but then we laughed, like there, at some point there was so much laughter and then in, in some places, like people got competitive, but we were having so much fun. And I think each of us, we were reminded one of the women, she was like, thank you for modeling this because it's a reminder that I need to go back and model this with folks on my team. Like we forget that we can have fun. Um, and that it's okay for us as a team to have fun. Like, it's not just making sure we have fun when we're with our, you know, our program participants, but like, it's important for us to have fun. So I would say those are my, my top three. And I, and I hear <clears throat> your statement around fun or it being a chief tool, the key ingredient, but you got a lot of people walking around angry looking, sad looking. It's, it's, they're going into work with scowls on, their frown faces, and then they leave, they're smiling and running to their car or, or public transportation. How can we cultivate a spirit of fun? And as you think about that, I think we have a picture of you looking like you're <laughs> having some fun, like you had a message on your hand. Let's take a look and you could tell us what the message said. Let's take a look. What's going on here? It says, I am imperfect and I am enough with a smiley face. Talk to us. What's up? <laughs> so this particular picture was with um, three of my friends. We were, we were reading a book and one, of, one piece of this book was about um, affirmations and the power that affirmations have. And we were to think about some of our limiting beliefs and then sort of cultivate a reminder. And so the way that I decided that I would tackle this and, and prove that I, I had focused on what I needed to focus on was this. Um, but yes, so I have, I am imperfect and I am enough. <laughs> and, and I think just as an adult, I've had to remind myself of that. Like yeah. so often, you know, you think, you know, you have to try to fix all of your imperfections or, or we don't think that we're enough. And so we need more of something or we need to be more like other people that we admire who have certain, you know, skills and talents and abilities that maybe we don't have. And so just reminding myself that like our imperfections are what make us unique and special and that honoring them and leaning into them and being our quirky, cool selves is what it's all about um and that we're enough you know just as as we are so so yeah it's, that's it's that's where that working. came from working so it's all right for me to do my carlton dancing right <laughs> it sure is as long as you find a community that's good with that that embraces you for sure. all of you sure. I, I love that you mentioned fun again i've been known to be people have said you're very intense well, I've been really leaning into that to see, I, I don't turn this off. I am intense, personally, professionally. So of late, we're talking about a week or so ago where I said, I'm going to turn down the intensity, lean back and have some more fun. So thank you for that reminder. Back to the audience, what do you think are at least three signs that indicate it's time to move on professionally from your current position. You talked a little bit about it. Can you circle back three signs for you to know that it's time to get up out of here? Well, definitely, I think the one is just lack of motivation, right? So, so in the world that I'm used to, it's, you know, we sort of call it burnout. And I think there's, you know, sort of first and sort of secondary burnout, right? Like sometimes burnout is like, you just need a break, yeah. right? Maybe you haven't been taking enough personal time. Maybe you've been working too many hours. So maybe it's not that you sort of outgrown where you are. It's just, you need better work-life balance in your current role. But I think when you get to that secondary level where you, you wake up in the morning and I'm laying in the bed and I'm like, oh, I don't want to get up. I, you know, I, the phone rings. 
I see certain numbers. I'm like, man, I don't want to. <laughs> and, and it's not just like one number. It's all the number, right? Yes. It was like, okay. Um, and I think for me, I felt um, like I wasn't, that I was slipping from authenticity because I felt like at some point I was starting to perform because as a leader, I knew I couldn't answer the questions the way that I wanted to answer it. But I was also very clear that it did not line up with how I truly felt. And I had spent most of my career being very honest with people like, this is what we can do. This is what we can't do. This is how I feel about this. And so when I felt like I, it was a show where I'm like, I'm giving you the, the answer that your, your leader should give you, but like, I don't buy that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is good. This is good. I, if you may not know, I, I did my doctoral research on authenticity mm. because I felt that during my sessions, people would say I'm one way at home, I'm one way at work, or I can't bring my full self to work. Mm. Um, that's why I leave some of it at home. Tell us about your journey to authenticity. I, you know, I, um, in some ways, I think I was blessed that it, at work, some of it just sort of happens. I think when I first my first role out of college was public accounting, and um, I was at Price where I was Hoopers, and I think I struggled there immensely around authenticity. Partly because it was just a new work environment, so so you want to show up and feel like you fit in, but like part of fitting in was like, well, let me just sort of demonstrate that I'm just like everybody else. But then some part of that. What did, that also struggle, what did that struggle feel like? Help me see what you went through. I hear the word struggle, but what did that feel like? What did that look like? When did it occur? Well, I think some of the some of it was like I was just participating in activities yes. that my colleagues were participating in that I did not like, but it was because I felt like I needed to do that to be accepted or to even just have something to talk about. Um, so I would you know, I'd watch things on TV that they watched. Like, I, you know, I'd try to, you know, play golf because that's what people are doing. The funny thing is now I actually have been trying to play because I'm like, oh, on a beautiful day, I totally get why people want to be out there. This is great. As you age, you can still play. But at the time, I had, like, no interest. It was really just to fit in. Um, and so, but then what I was really doing was, like, hanging out in like jazz clubs and and listening to the old soul artists so it was almost like if you saw a picture on me on saturday i might have like a patchwork denim skirt and a head wrap and then on monday i show up like <laughs> golf shirt <laughs> yes 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 been I'm there like, done that half the t-shirt shot glass and refrigerator magnet to prove it's it weird. been there and it's weird right like it it, it, it was weird so so i think so during that phase, it was like, I'm trying to fit in. I'm trying to find ways to have something to talk about. You know, most of the time, the project teams were primarily all men, almost never people of color, let alone Black people on the teams. Um, so really struggled there. And then as I moved around, like at some point when I got to the nonprofit world, maybe some of it was naturally that people just felt like they were more themselves. Like there was no quote unquote brand yeah. anymore. Um, and I used to joke that like our, our team, I used to, we used to call ourselves a band of misfits. Like we were a whole host of people that like, if you were to talk to us, you'd be like, you all work together and that works. <laughs> but it, it, like, I think, so, so I think I was fortunate that being there, people just were more open and honest about who they are and what they like and what they don't like, um, which I think allowed me or, or created a space where I felt comfortable sort of yeah. being the same way. And then as I started moving into leadership, it just became clear that I was like, I was always drawn to people that I thought I understood as a person. Like, they were all physical, you know, you're like, I like this guy. You know, what you see is what you get. And I, I find that those are generally people that I feel like I can trust. And so that just became a, 
something for me that was important was being able to build trust with people that you work so closely with. And I, and I felt like I couldn't be anything other than who I am. And I wanted everybody else on the team to do the same, right? And, so, and I love that you have cultivated um, a persona of humility and authenticity. And it, I believe it has helped you even tackle some of the challenging um, problems that you have tackled, racism, uh, inclusion, equity. As a matter of fact, we have a video of you talking about creating <laughs> more equity uh, for the underserved. Let's take a look at this quick clip. You see racism in what you do? Absolutely. So, you know, I think one of the things that we've noticed is that oftentimes in the social service world, we tend to confuse or assume individual deficits instead of system deficits. And so, you know, many times our participants are struggling to navigate systems because the systems, and this was a point that actually Jay had raised as we were talking about and planning for this, is that the reason that our families struggle is because the system was never designed with their interests in mind. Um, for me, the work that we do, you see it in like every category if we look at social determinants determinants of health. So it's housing, it's health, it's education, it's early childhood education. I mean, it really sort of permeates in every area in, in all the work that we do. And um, for example, if we look at housing, so, you know, black kids, the asthma mortality rates are eight times higher than white kids nationally. And we know that that can actually be tied to insufficient and unstable and low quality housing. Um, we also, if you look at child welfare services, we also know that we have, you know, families who are in our care because they have unstable housing. So not because they're physically abusing their child, not because there's addiction, but the neglect is so significant because they lack housing. And so I think these are all the ways that we start to sort of see our families in the system. But I think there are a number of things that we could do differently so that these individuals don't end up in our care and that we can really sort of focus on the folks that we really need to. So, I, I mean, Sandra, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's definitely a bit of like how we, we see this manifesting in social services. Wow, 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 wow. Woo! You just put your thing down, right? You just, <laughs> you went, Mm, let me break it down, break it down. What was it like taking a look at that and what comes to mind as you continue to think about the injustices that are out there, so systemic injustices that are out there? Mm, I, you know, it's it makes me really angry, actually. You know, I've been following what's happening in Jackson, Mississippi, and I'm like, to live in America, you know, we and we tend to go around the world wanting to fix everybody else, right? Because we're the best nation, we're the most equitable nation, and here we are. We have a we have communities of people who don't have water. I mean, uh, the most basic of resources, right? Like we can't figure out how to get get water to people, and we know that we can. We we have just deprioritized it for this black community in Jackson, Mississippi. We've decided it, it's okay to not fix the infrastructure and ensure they have water. Like, and so, so, it, so when you think about system deficits, all of these individual households, people will have these struggles, people with more financial means will go and find water in other places and will be able to figure it out. And those who have no resources or, or very, very like minimal resources will struggle. And it's like, they will be without water. We looked at this in Flint, we said it wouldn't happen again. And here we are, like government systems have decided they won't fix it because, you know, it's hard for me to believe that people really care. Yeah. Um, so, it, so for me, it's really, it's really, really frustrating. Um, and, I, and I think having worked in human services, it, it's given me a different connection around how these system issues impact people's everyday lives, right? So it's not just something you look at on TV and you have no idea. We, you sit with families who don't have basic resources and you see how this impacts someone's life every day, 365 days per year. I remember 
long time ago. I just gotten out of school and one of my favorite sports casters and writers wrote a book, Ralph Wiley, who's no longer with us, but the book was called Why Black People Tend to Shout. Mm. And it, it wasn't a book on lower class. It was the affluent, the people who have perceived made it and the, why they still are frustrated or why we are still frustrated in everyday life. And that was in the 80s. And as I think about some of the things that are still going on in our society, we're still shouting. We're still shouting. We're still shouting. Question in from the audience. It says, what do you think are some important items a person should consider or even have in place before establishing a consulting firm? So this is going back to what we were talking about earlier about why did you jump? What played a role in you jumping? So the question is asking, what do you think are some important items a person should consider or even have in place before establishing a consulting firm? And for me, if I was answering that question, business plan, marketing plan, have your plan in place and work your plan. How about you? So I would agree with that. I would definitely say have your plan in place. I think the second thing would be ensuring you have some form of a sustainable client base before you take the leap. I mean, we've all worked with people who are so desperate that they call every day, essentially sort of begging for work, right? Like they'll, they'll do any work because you need money to live. And I, you know, every time folks are like, well, I'm thinking about it. I was like, well, make sure you're clear. Like, who will you actually be working with or for when you first take this leap? Or do you have enough money saved to cover your expenses while you build a client base? But I was like, nothing, I think one feels more devaluing, right? Than, than the continual sort of need for work. And then I think people end up struggling to find their sweet spot because then you'll you'll take projects that may not really fit with your expertise because you need the money, then you won't actually do very well with that work. And then it just sort of becomes a self-fulfilling sort of prophecy in terms of how your consulting practice ends up working or not working in many cases. So that's why I'm like, if you're in a field where you can you know, have a client or two um, as you make the transition, or you can test it out to see if you really like it. I mean, it's one thing, like I, I joke with my husband, you know, I was like, I forgot how hard it is to like have to do all the work, right? Like I've gotten very small. You have a team, team of really smart people. You have ideas. They take your ideas, they execute, they come back with drafts of things. When you're the sole practitioner, I'm like, oh, I just sat in a meeting and came up with a really great idea. Now I have to like go do it. <laughs> <laughs> you got to bring it home. You got to bring it home. Right. I was like, there's there's no one to be like, we love this idea. Can you actually like come back with an outline of how we'd approach it? Like every piece of it is now mine to curate, right? So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's inspiring work. It's nice to have flexibility um, around schedule, but it is, in fact, a lot of work, right? To, to work for yourself. Um, and, and it's different. And I think you have to decide if you like that, right? You know, like it's not, it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and it's probably not for every season of life either. Um, a so, a person to be an entrepreneur, and it takes a special person to be the person of that entrepreneur or, or the spouse or the partner because. It's different things every day, every day. We'll never say same stuff, different day. Mm -mm. Entrepreneurs don't say that. I agree, mm -hmm. I agree. I want you to tell me about a time, and I'll set it up this way. I think it was in sometime between 93 and 96, I was working for the Vanguard Group. I was doing management development. I told my boss that I want to own my own company. I want to get into speaking, motivationally, presentation skills. And we worked it so that after I did a leadership uh, competency model or, or at least some training, that I would go back to the department and do a motivational talk. During those times, I realized that there's something there. Um, tooting my own horn, I was good. And I realized that speaking is something I was going to do. When did you realize that you were special, you had a gift, that you were a phenomenal leader, um, that you just really empowered people when did you when did you find your lane mm. 
Find somebody tell, tell me about what contributed to that. Were you at Penn? Were you at Lincoln? Were you working in corporate, the nonprofit? Uh, when did you find your rhythm? And then you started using it. So can, mm. you, can you think of a time when, when that happened? I wish I could say it was at Lincoln, but it definitely, <laughs> it definitely was not quite that <laughs> that soon. Um, it was probably when I, I think I realized my lane around impacting people as um, an executive director. I think that was where I was just able to engage with people in, yeah. in a very different way. Um, I definitely realized that I like, you know, when I started to think about, well, what are the parts of my job that I enjoy? I, I really like the people parts of the job. So mm -hmm. going to certain meetings that some people are like, please let me sit in the office. I'm like, oh, I'm here for it. I'm ready for it. I'm excited, you know? People would ask me to participate in panels. I like that. I liked all of the big meetings, bringing people together, um, you know, sort of leading those conversations. That was the part, those were parts of the job that I really, really liked. And I felt very comfortable um, and it didn't feel like work. So I think th that was the one thing where I was like, when I'm here in this room with you all, like, this feels like a gift. This does not feel like a job. It, it feels like a privilege. It feels very natural. So, so though, so I think that's when it became clear to me and people seem to respond really well. That's when it became clear to me that I'm like, okay, there's something here um, for me in particular. So, so, so that's like when I think I, I really yeah. realized it. And then through, was able, I think, to refine and cultivate it through having like our agency galas and having event, you know, bigger events and being sort of on a larger stage and, and feeling like I was getting better at that particular skill, I think is when I was like, all right, I'm, I'm made for these, these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. And doing my research on you, I, I saw so many things that really moved me, touched me. This video right here, where you are talking when you're in your role at the time with Turning Points for Children. It's just a short clip, but it really spoke to who you are as a leader, as an individual, and that you just love to give. Let's take a look. Look, to redefine what's possible for children and families here in the city, we work with folks that we think come to us at vulnerable points in their life. And we believe that through our help, they find their turning points and that their life can be different. Uh, we have a wide variety of services. We have foster care and adoption services. We have a food program that offers food to families in need. We have a facility for young people who are on drugs. We know opioids are a big problem now in the city. And then we also have programs like YB Life Set that work with young adults who are transitioning into adulthood. When you see that, and consider where you were and now where you are, what comes to mind? Mm. I think that that body of work in a lot of ways for me, I think helped me become more connected to like the most vulnerable in our society. I think in a way that I, I always had an interest. I was always a big volunteer. I always knew that each of us should be giving back in some way. Like that part was always there. Okay. But I think in my mind, there was still a little bit of like them and us, right? And I think it was through doing that work and, and sitting face to face with people that you realize that we are all the same. And but for a series of life events, but for a family structure, like, this this easily could have been me, right? And 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 seeing so much talent in, in folks that just like never had the opportunity to be refined or honed, or people just never had the spaces that you and I have had. So so I think it it really helped me see how we are all one in in a very sort of personal way. Um, and so so when I see those videos, like that's one thing that that certainly comes to mind. And I think now when I look at it, I, I feel grateful in some ways to be a little more distanced from some of that work. I mean, when, when 
you are are in that world every day there is a crisis every day you know when you watch the news i used to tell my husband when i watch the news like i have anxiety because i hear something and i know the neighborhood and i'm like oh my god i wonder if that kid was one yeah. of our kids like and it just doesn't stop so there there is a part of me the the selfish part of me that's grateful that when I hear these things, I'm not worried if that is one of our children, one of our young people, if one of our team members knows this individual personally, and then it's like supporting that family, supporting that team member. Um, so so it, it it's both like a gift sure. and a curse because it comes with a really heavy sort of sort of price, but but it, it really has put me, I think, in tune with each of us should figure out how to do our part yeah. in working to make our society better. And I think we each have different gifts and talents and ways that we can sort of do that. But but that was really the place that I think mm -hmm. helped me get clear. Because when I left Inroads originally, I was like, I want money. I'm going, <laughs> I was like, I'm going to college so that I can make money. I was not somewhere thinking about how I was going to help others. <laughs> Well, you just mentioned gift, curse, bittersweet, and gosh, time is, is is running away right now. But tell me about the research you've been doing on Black leaders of late. What has yeah. that been like? It, it, you know, in some ways it's inspiring because I feel like I sit in these conversations and I feel more hopeful than I did before that if these are some of the individuals working in communities and trying to solve these problems, like I actually believe it's possible. On the flip side, it's sometimes frustrating that some of the same things that my parent that our parents were angry about and frustrated about still seem to permeate our systems and our culture and tend to be barriers for these leaders. So their inability to access capital, there's more barriers to capital. Um, this notion that many of, of them are in some way inferior to other organizations, and it's like you know, this org has been around for 100 years, and this one's been around for three. I mean, we can't really compare them and say that that they're exactly the same, and that people have invested in certain leaders and certain organizations for decades. And so if we choose to make the same investments in these organizations, they most certainly sure. would mirror um these other things. So, so, so that has been a big part of it and wanting to figure out like, what can we do about it? Like, how, how can we solve this problem? If, because it's not just skills, right? Um, you know, I always tell people proposal writing is a skill. Like we give people money who write the best proposals, but that's really a skill. That doesn't actually mean they can deliver, right? That doesn't mean they have community connections. The group of folks that I'm speaking with, we know they have that. So it's also like, how do we just teach them some of these other skills that maybe they don't naturally have based on their orientation to the work? But I think it's valuing these things equally and just deciding to prioritize, you know, the, these Black leaders, right? So, so I don't know what will what if anything will happen, but I think there's a lot that we should be thinking about um, around that work and being accountable and responsible and resourceful. How did you manage to train and get ready for the Broad Street Run? I think we have a picture of you after you did the run. Let's take a look. Mm. You do. Wow. Used to be used to be much more active. Um, <laughs> I had a goal of running a half marathon. Mm. So, you know, Broad Street is 10 miles. I actually did achieve my goal of running a half marathon. It's funny, recently I, I just said to my a husband, I think marathon. I'm gonna wow. try to pick that back up. Well, in your spare time, right? You have to no, you have to make time for health. Yes, yes. Before we let you go. We conclude all of our shows the same way. Since I am a speaker, I asked our guests to give us a M-I-N-I, -I, a mini keynote, 30 seconds, where you, you are challenging us, inspiring us, motivating you, dropping your last nugget. This is the last thing they're going to see. And you know, with adults, it's primacy and recency. People remember the first or the last. This is the last thing they're going to remember from your appearance on our show today. So 
30 seconds, hit the mic, mic check, mic check, lean in. The next voice you will hear will be that of Dawn Holden Woods, dropping some pearls, no pun intended, on us. What's most important with our life is that when we wake up in the morning, we feel we feel inspired, we feel good about it, and we feel like we're making a contribution both to our families and our broader community. And so I think through our work, each of us should figure out how to do that. If you're not doing that, then you should figure out how you can do that, both where you are or, or make a change. And how can you inspire others, right? Like, it's not just about inspiring yourself, but it's how can you help someone else? Part of the co-conspirator co for good is I feel like we should all be conspiring for something better and to help each other. And so, you know, my work is really about helping leaders, helping people reach their full potential, whatever your goals is. Your goals are how can we do that together? And I think each of us needs to figure out in our in our environments, how can we do that for someone else? Bam! Bam! <laughs> Enjoy this. This was an amazing, amazing hour. A lot of pearls, wisdom, vulnerability. Dawn is powerful. Dawn, how can people reach you if they want to bring your organization in? Where should they go? Sure. So if you go to uh, gcpadvisors.com, you will find um, a website or you can just shoot me an email at dawn, D-A-W-N, at gcpadvisors.com. Thank you for taking time from your oh-so-busy schedule to spend time with us on the Dr. James Show. I'm sure many, many people will benefit from the words and thoughts you shared with them. And I want to say to you folks, thank you for tuning in. Tune in again next week. Bring a guest or two or three. And like I always say, we create informational and transformational experiences. And always remember, you've just been gym-packed. See you later.